Welcome everyone. We'll get started in just a second. We're going to go live on Facebook as well. So you can either watch the, the Zoom meeting or you can watch us live on the City of Georgetown's Facebook page. All right, we're live on Facebook too. Awesome. Mm -hmm. All right. And I'm so excited about this one. Um, this is going to be a really fun presentation. This is uh, for everybody who's joining us. This is a presentation we've been really excited about for the past few months. Um, we've done some planning around this uh, and, and the post office's birthday. Um, there is so much more than just this building to the post office history, and we're going to cover yes. as much of it as we can. So. Um, that should be pretty fun for, for everybody who's interested in Georgetown's history, also really interested in the Postal Service history. Uh, we're going to cover some aspects that are uh, outside of Georgetown, too, uh, just to get a good picture. So uh, what this is probably going to end up in my top three. <laughs> my top three Tuesday talks. This is happening right now. Um, so give us one second, and we will get the presentation shared. Yes, there's some definitely interesting characters throughout the Postal Service. We didn't even touch on post office dogs, so <laughs> that's a whole history of itself. Well, uh, we'll, we'll have to do a, a follow up presentation. Uh, so we are right at noon and um, thanks everybody so much for joining us for our second very special Tuesday talks for the month of May. May is National Historic Preservation Month, and we are really glad to be here telling stories about places that are really important to Georgetown's history and that are the reason we get to celebrate Preservation Month and make sure everybody knows the good, important work uh, that are done that help uh, maintain Georgetown's historic character. So I'm Britton Bostick. I'm the City of Georgetown Downtown and Historic Planner. And joining me is my very excellent colleague, Ann Evans, City of Georgetown's reference librarian and knower of so many excellent local stories. Um, Ann is uh, just a wealth of knowledge and information, uh, Georgetown extraordinaire resident, uh, and is really great to have her uh, sharing stories that I am sometimes surprised by. Anne has an amazing uh, and slightly creepy story about the post office um, that I really think um, beats uh, many of her, her prior stories. So we're excited to share that with y'all. As we get started, um, don't forget, we're celebrating Preservation Month um, for a lot of great reasons. And as we do that, one of the things that uh, Preservation Month is special for is because it's an opportunity for us to highlight our historic architecture and the buildings that we love so much today that were built a long time in the past, some more long time than others. So this month we're celebrating buildings that are turning 90, buildings that are turning 110. If you missed it last week, we celebrated the Williamson County Courthouse and the Williamson Museum buildings 110th birthdays. Um, so that's really incredible. By the time we're done with this month's celebrations, we'll hit buildings with 125 and 135 years of history. One of the ways that we're able to continue to enjoy those buildings today is through our design guidelines for our historic district. So we have two special districts in Georgetown, the downtown overlay district and the old town overlay district kind of between downtown and southwestern. And those special districts have very special requirements for changes to properties in those districts, new buildings constructed in those districts and then demolition requests. And so we are updating our design guidelines right now if you are uh, joining us via our Zoom, you can check historic.georgetown.org for more information on that update. There's lots of project information, there's open house videos, and the proposed uh, update documents. The changes that are being proposed to the design guidelines are posted there. You can click on those, access them online, or download them if you need to. And we are trying to capture public input on that draft this week. If you need more information or want to reach out to our planning staff to help, you can call 
3581 or you can email historic at georgetown.org. We'll have both of those uh, contact information pieces at the end of this program too. And then you can also visit the planning department office. We're at 809 Martin Luther King Jr. Street. Our front door faces City Hall. So if you need to come visit us in person, if that's better for you, please feel free to do that. We'd be happy to share more details about the project and, and get you the information that you need. But online resources are, are available for you also, um, especially if you're uh, still staying home and uh, limiting uh, going out. So please know that that's accessible, uh, but you can always get us by phone too. So uh, as we do that and get that update, Part of celebrating Preservation Month is getting to celebrate uh, taking good care of these historic buildings. Uh, we're also going to share some information about an event the Williamson Museum is doing on Saturday. That'll be great fun. So go ahead and put Saturday between 10 and 12 uh, in the morning on Saturday on your calendar and we'll give you an explanation as to why at the end of the program. So uh, the downtown post office building a little bit different than the post office building that a lot of us know. Uh, the one that I visited a lot is not the downtown post office building, but this is the one that's turning 90 years old this year. Uh, so we wanted to start out uh, by sharing a little bit of context, if you will. What was it like to have uh, a post office back in the 1800s? Georgetown was uh, founded about 170 years ago. We had a postmaster as early as 1849. But what was that like? Um, and you were telling me the postmaster back then allegedly carried the mail around in his hat. Yes. So Andrew McKay was one of our first postmasters in Georgetown once it was changed from the name Brushy, which it had been in 1848-ish, 1847, kind of loosely called Brushy. Um, and then, of course, Williamson County is founded. The city of Georgetown is founded. We get an actual post office in 1849. Andrew McKay is named postmaster. And the mail didn't come that frequently. It came maybe two, maybe three times a week, usually arriving via stagecoach. Um, and most of the time it was a big event. People, the stagecoach would honk its horn about a mile outside of town and everyone would run to town so excited to get their mail. But of course, if you didn't pick up your mail, then you could either go in person and pick it up or sometimes the postmaster might carry it around. We weren't a big town. So uh, the story is that Mr. McKay would carry the mail around in his hat to deliver it instead of getting a bag or anything like that. Uh, makes me think he probably wasn't delivering too many large packages, but maybe he had a big hat. I don't know. <laughs> a really big 10 gallon cowboy hat, cowboy hat. Uh, is what I'm thinking. Uh, like he either had a very small head and a big hat or just not that much mail, but like you said, mail delivery wasn't every day. There weren't a whole lot of people here. Um, letters were really special. So you didn't have phone calls at that time. Uh, definitely didn't have social media to keep up with friends and family. And so mail was how you got the news from family, from friends, um, from parts uh, abroad. And so that would have been a much more exciting thing uh, than it is today. Now we think of the mail in terms of I got a bill or I got a notice about something and that may not be very pleasant. Um, but then at the time, like you said, people were running from their houses to go see if they had gotten any mail. Um, the post office we think was co-located with a grocery store on the square uh, on the Southeast corner. Um, it would have been in a building that's not there today. We know that anything that was there in 1867 is not there today. And um, a whole new set of buildings have been constructed since, but you wouldn't, even in 1867, I guess, and you wouldn't have had a dedicated post office building. It wouldn't have, I guess, had enough activity to be its own thing. And being with a grocery store would have made good sense. Yes. So in that time period, um, the post office, the United States post office, if the town or area wasn't large enough to warrant a dedicated building, they would contract out. Um, so they would contract to local merchants. You see it in hotels. You see it in a lot of times in grocery stores. Um, sometimes private homes, not very often. There's only really one instance where I know it was in a private home and that was in the 1840s here in Georgetown. Um, but there's a lot of either general stores that it's housed in. Sometimes, like I said, it was in a hotel. It was in the eight hotel several times. Um, between the 1850s and 1860s. 
but as you'll see kind of a little bit later, it bounced around the square a lot. <laughs> it really I don't did. know how many times it moved. <laughs> We lost track and uh, and we had a hard time figuring out what happened before 1885. So uh, we'll 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 bring y'all with us on a, a on a trip around the square following the post office over the years. Um, something that was really funny to me uh, when I when I was uh, preparing for this uh, presentation was I had just really had underestimated um, the amount of uh, kind of gossipy interest that can occur from the postmaster role. I also really underestimated the role of women as, as postmaster or postmistress as they were sometimes called. And um, I didn't realize that people might have some pretty strong objections to the postmaster. So we grabbed some newspaper clippings from Georgetown. This is the Georgetown Watchman newspaper. Um, it was kind of a, a maybe a four page total, you know, two pages front and back publication. Uh, that was that was printed here. And so these are from 1869 and 1871. But it says the postmaster and clerk of the Brenham office, so Brenham is a town uh, an hour or so east of here, were arrested a few days ago for their inability to account for a valuable letter registered and mailed at LaGrange for Brenham. And so even far back as 1869, we had registered mail. So that's not a new concept. That's something that's been in place for a long time. Also, you were held responsible as the postmaster for the safe delivery of registered mail. Um, also, we have, and this was printed in the Georgetown paper, this news from Virginia made it all the way here. The young lady who presides over the Richmond, Virginia post office, and remember this is 1869, has decided that she is a postmaster and not a postmistress or a postmiss. And help me out real quick. Are women postmasters or are they postmistresses? According to the US Postal Service, they're still postmasters. Postmaster. So, so postmaster um, is a postmaster. We kind of joke in my family that everybody's a cowboy. Um, and this seems kind of on par with that. Yes, very similar. We did have uh, a gentleman in Florence. So uh, just outside of Georgetown, uh, another uh, community that's separate from Georgetown, it, its own identity. Uh, but Florence, uh, there was a man who really took issue with the postmaster. And uh, there was an article printed in the Watchman that's titled, Put Him Out. And it says, we are in receipt of a letter from a gentleman residing at Florence, Texas, justly complaining that the postmaster at that place will not deliver him the democratic statesman for which he has paid his money. He says, we are uh, cursed with a three cent thief at this place who glories in the name P.H. Adams, our village postmaster. When I was in Austin last week, I subscribed for your paper and paid you for it. On my return home, I found it in the office and Mr. P.H. Adams, PM, postmaster, refused to deliver it to me unless I would pay him letter postage. He says there are some pencil marks or writing on the inside of the wrapper. I called on a gentleman to witness the fact that I tendered him the money for the postage on the first quarter of the paper, but he refused to deliver it unless I would pay him letter postage. If you can't send me your paper, I think you could send me a radical paper. I know he will let that come free of any postage as he is one of Mr. J. E. J. Davis's special pimps. And that was printed in the Democratic Statesman. <laughs> and so really strong language being used uh, yes. back at that time, especially about the postmaster and, uh, and someone taking issue with the way that they chose to conduct business and, and what the fee was charged, that three cent fee uh, for that delivery charge. And so if you think stamps are expensive now, um, he couldn't even get his paper delivered. <laughs> And also a good point is if you ever want like salacious gossip about people you don't know because they're long dead, the 1860s and 1870s papers are usually Just wonderful examples. I think, I think one of our Tuesday Talks episodes in the future is going to be Anne and I reading from the newspaper from 1869. Um, it is quite something. Um, and even the advertisements are really wonderful. So those are available online. Um, if you go to, uh, for example, you can go to uh, the portal to Texas history, uh, their website, you can search for uh, Georgetown, Texas, and then look at newspapers, and you can read scanned copies of 
that's how I found uh, this Watchman newspaper. There are other newspapers, the Southwestern University Megaphone. So the oh. portal just tends to be a really good resource to find those archives. The originals are at the Dolph Briscoe Center for American History at the UT campus. And so uh, the portal to Texas history is uh, kind of a collector of these archives that are located in different university libraries and collections. And they uh, have a program to digitize and make those publicly available. And we find great fun in being able to access those. But uh, before we go any further, we want to chase the post office around the square and show you that it really moved a lot. Uh, so Anne, to the maps. To the maps. Y'all know I love Sanborn maps. They do a lot to help me quickly navigate um, what's going on in our downtown. The earliest Sanborn map that we have is from 1885. And it shows the post office at that time was on the north side of the square. So a little bit of orientation, north is up. Where you see St. Gabriel, that's 7th Street. So that's the north side of the square. Uh, Brushy is Austin Avenue. Um, Oak Street is 8th Street now. And then Main Street is the only one that stayed the same uh, in that map. And so about where the Harry Gold building is, um, kind of right there in the middle of the north side of the square. This is not the same set of buildings, so uh, these are different buildings. What we can see from the map is that um, they are indicated in yellow, so they're wood construction buildings. Uh, they're not the brick and stone buildings that are there today, with a couple of exceptions. The building on each corner where Grape Creek Winery is and where uh, a building's under renovation, the Lockett Building, which we'll talk about later this month, those are stone buildings. Everything else is wood and it's since been replaced, but at the time, the post office had its own building finally on the north side of the square. It had a wood awning out front. This is a time when we still have dirt streets around the downtown um, and not the, the grand beautiful Victorian era buildings that we have today. And it looks like it's the same in 1889. It looks like the post office was still in the same place, hadn't moved. Um, and so if you wanted to go to the post office, it had its own dedicated building on the north side of the square. In 1894 though, or at least between, you know, 1889 and 1894, uh, the post office moved. So it went from the north side of the square to the Masonic Hall, uh, which was, it, this is a two-story building now. So the post office is on the first floor, Masonic Hall is on the second floor. And this is the, the corner of the square where you would see uh, gumbos today. And you would see the, the stone old Masonic Lodge building. Um, that building didn't start out as stone. That building started out as a wood building for the Masonic Hall and they had the post office um, probably as a tenant. Like Anne said, if, if they didn't have kind of a dedicated space, they might rent space um, similar to other federal or governmental facilities that, that might not have a dedicated building. Still wood construction. And so what's interesting to me about this is that um, we see the 1900 map on the right. In 1900, the new Masonic Lodge which for us is the old Masonic Lodge, was under construction. The Galveston hurricane of 1900 came up and they had just finished the exterior stone walls. Charles Belford built that building and it was noted at the time that the walls were so sturdily constructed that not even the hurricane winds could knock it down. People had been very concerned that the stones would be dislodged from the, the strong winds of that hurricane as it came up through Texas and, and had some impacts on Georgetown. But it was under construction and during that time the post office had to move out so the old building could be demolished and the new building constructed. And so they moved to the location which y'all would know is 600 degrees today. So where we now have uh, a very popular pizza place that used to be in the post office. And it was a building that I think was owned by uh, the Eidmans. Um, I haven't been able to confirm that yet but it looks like uh, Oscar Eidman uh, was the owner of that building. He was a prominent businessman in Georgetown and um, had strong relationship with Southwestern University and I believe also the Waterworks. And this was a period of time that he was kind of wrapping up his involvement in Georgetown uh, and ultimately moved to Baytown. But he was a very prominent member of the community. So it would have made sense that he kind of would have taken the post office in while they needed a temporary location. So um, I've already lost count of how many times we moved, so y'all try to keep track as we keep going around the square. The post office uh, moved back to the Masonic Lodge uh, building after it was completed, but they were not in the front in a prominent location, they were toward the back. And so if you look at that building today along East 7th Street, 
um, kind of across the street from uh, the Big Bear or from Galaxy Bakery. If you look across the street, there's kind of a, a back entrance with a, a door and some windows, uh, not quite as prominent. It looks like that would have been the post office entrance. So um, you can see on the north side of the square, the building that the post office had been in was demolished. It wasn't there anymore. That yellow building had gone away. A couple of new buildings were built in blue, which indicates stone. Um, but they were in a much smaller space, it looks like, than they had, had been. But they were there for quite a while. And so uh, they were there from about 1900 or 1901 to at least 1910. And in the 1910 map on the right, we can still see that they're there in that building. Here's a picture of it. And so uh, this is the Masonic Lodge before the Onion Dome disappeared for a period of decades and then ultimately has come back, yay. Um, but the post office was with a drugstore, the Masonic Hall was on the second floor, and then we can see the post office was advertised on the awning with the drugstore. So that's kind of a fun photo. This photo is from, I think, around 1908, um, and so the post office had been um, in place for a little bit. So you can kind of look back toward the left, and you would have entered back there rather than through the, the main entrance up at the front. The post office moved a few more times though. We're still journeying around the square. Uh, it, it didn't stay there. And so uh, the post office by 1916 had moved back to the north side of the square, this time in a brick building, in a building that I believe uh, was a single story. So it wasn't a, a two story, it was its own, uh, it, its own building, its own space at that time. Um, this is, 1916, remember this year, because this is going to come up again in our story in a little bit when we talk about um, a pretty controversial choice for Postmaster. Um, and so at the time that this uh, controversy over the Postmaster was occurring, this is when they were uh, back on the north side of the square. And then by 1925, we have a big gap. Uh, we don't have any maps uh, that are digitized from 1916 to 1925. And so by 1925, the post office had moved to the Makinson building. Uh, you might know it, uh, know it as the Makinson Hotel, or if you've been in Georgetown a while, the ice cream bucket was there. Um, today, it's uh, kind of a series of offices, and then also there's an artisan gallery there um, in that location. So if you uh, go by Artisans Connect, that's about where the post office was for a period of time in 1925. But that was when they were preparing for their first uh, building in the sense that we think of a post office, this grand formal federal architecture. Um, it was kind of in the planning stages probably about that time. And ultimately, we end up with the post office in the location that we're much more familiar with. They're uh, just kind of a block off the square on 8th Street and Church Streets. And so by 1940, we can see that it's definitely in place fireproof construction uh, that was built in 1931 and listed very prominently as the post office. But the map, uh, again, we have a gap from 1925 to 1940. So the post office was really built in 1931. And we can see it from these photos in 1934 when it was pretty brand new already. You're gonna notice some key differences. Um, yes, that part on the back was, was built with it. Um, it does look different today than it used to. So that what looked like an, a, an addition on the back, that was something that they would have used for mail trucks and being able to put mail onto the trucks more easily. You don't see the trees that we have around it today. And um, in fact, you don't see a lot of the trees around the square that we enjoy today. So it kind of set off by itself on its site. Um, and you can tell though that not a lot has changed to the building's exterior in all these years which is kind of wonderful that the post office building that we see today is very similar to the one that they were seeing in 1934. The other photos I have are a little bit blurry, um, so I'm sorry they're not a better quality, but if you kind of look at the building today and then look at these photos, you can tell those same features. And then here we see it again, um, right close to the square, like very, very much in the center of things, but um, not connected at all to any other buildings. It was built as a separately constructed structure What's important about this is this was built at a time when we already had the automobile in Georgetown very prominently, whereas many of the other buildings around the square had been built pre-automobile. And so this space around the building was in part due to the need to move vehicles around the building because that's what they were using at that time. So the later uh, time period construction is for a building 
usually the more accommodations are made for vehicles. It was so also built wanted, after the roads were paved downtown. So that's important to know as well. That's a really good point. So, and yet I hadn't, I hadn't thought of that. So remind me when were streets paved in the downtown? In the downtown, the immediate downtown would have been the early 1920s. It kind of, okay. the further you get from downtown, the later it tends to go to the 30s, 40s, 50s even. Um, but the immediate downtown would have been around 1922, um, and overseen by John Sharp, who we'll talk about a little bit later. Awesome. And you can see um, in this photo, there's some really big, generous sidewalks. Um, and people are kind of parking right up on the sidewalk, uh, angled in parking, similar to what we do today. Um, it's just if you were to take the same photo today, uh, you would have a lot of trees hiding the building facade. Y'all know I struggle with that frequently, all the trees in the way of seeing the buildings, but that's okay because the trees uh, provide a lot of value. We wanted to talk a bit about postmasters, um, not only Georgetown, but in other places. This was something I didn't know a whole lot about previously. Um, it's a job that maybe didn't last a really long time. Um, and I'll, I'll talk to you more about it, but postmasters tended to be from pretty prominent families. And I did find this narrative about um, a man named Jonathan Lee Brooks, who is in the book, A History of Texas and Texans. Uh, so Frank White Johnson was so fascinated by uh, Mr. Brooks that he wrote many pages about his life, including, and I thought this was so interesting. It gives you a sense that a lot of different people were postmaster you have the gentleman carrying the mail around in his hat, and then you have a Vanderbilt grad. And so uh, the, the excerpt from this book says he entered Vanderbilt University on a scholarship from Southwestern University, so really well educated, in the fall of 1893, and remained one year taking courses in theology and modern languages, French and German. After six years of hardworking college, his health being poor, any recent grads might be able to relate, Mr. Brooks returned to Texas, spent another year on his father's ranch, completely recovered, and after a year more in business, succeeded his father as postmaster at Georgetown in 1896, and for three years served acceptably as a public official in his hometown. Um, there appear to be other postal connections with the Brooks family. I believe Jonathan Brooks' aunt was postmaster in Bastrop. Uh, his father was postmaster, and then it looks like uh, Mr. Brooks went on to be a, a postmaster general for the federal government. It looks like he kind of continued that postal service, but at um, a higher level, and I believe he ultimately moved to Washington. If you want more information, uh, you can grab that book, but that's what we were able to see. And then if you uh, use the postmaster finder on the U.S. Postal Service website, uh, you can see there's a section that we have showing uh, Georgetown postmasters since 1981. And so you can see here too, a lot of times the postmaster role is not something you keep for a long time. It may be shorter duration. You can see a couple of, you know, for 1988, for example, there were three postmasters um, car, or, or people playing that role um, as the officer in charge. And so uh, kind of leading the organization um, of the post office. Uh, and so that's kind of fun. But and you have really done a lot of research into uh, this role and some histories. Uh, sometimes we refer to these as hidden histories, things that may not be uh, an easy part uh, of our knowledge or, or something that's commonly known. Turns out there were a lot of women and African-American women who played a postmaster yes. role. And I'm really kind of excited about that. Um, but let's stop, start with John Sharp. Um, it's a name that people might be familiar with because of uh, Mr. Sharp's role in Georgetown. Yes, so John Sharp, um, if you're not familiar with him, uh, Georgetown, again, was small, really, until relatively recently. So you get this few little group of prominent citizens playing the same roles over and over and over again, and John Sharp is one of them. Um, he actually moves here from Liberty Hill to start working at the Williamson County Sun in the late 19th century. Um, and very early in the 1900s becomes the owner and editor of the Williamson County Sun. And then he starts getting his hands involved in just about every area and aspect of Georgetown, like many of the men in charge of businesses tend to do at that time period. 
So of course he becomes mayor. He is one of our uh, longer serving mayors. He is mayor in the early 1920s when the streets are paved. Uh, he is also mayor at a time when the city council passed a uh, resolution uh, prohibiting public affection displays <laughs> in, the early 1900s, in the 1920s. Um, so if you weren't married, you couldn't kiss each other or hold hands in downtown Georgetown, um, which if you think about it in the time, it's the roaring 20s, people are starting to get a little bit maybe uh, riskier in their behavior than they had been prior to that. So that was the city trying to maybe legislate some of that behavior. Um, and so, and then he becomes eventually postmaster and he's one of the earliest postmasters in the building we are talking about today. Um, so he is involved in a lot, but basically the Williamson County Sun between 1900 and 1948, I believe is when it was sold to the current owners. Wow. Or family. Um, and then he, so do I remember correctly, his wife was also very involved in the newspaper. Is that right? Oh, she was very involved in the newspaper. She, um, it's hard to prove, but we wonder if she perhaps took a lot of the photographs from that time period that appear. Mm -hmm. um, she definitely was her own woman. There's a lot of, uh, again, on the portal of Texas history, you can look her up. There's a lot of photographs of her just kind of doing her own thing, um, driving carriages around town, uh, <laughs> taking photographs on the square of a very variety of things like when the circus came to town and there were elephants that paraded past the courthouse. Um, we have Annie, uh, Annie Sharp to thank for those photographs. So th thankfully the Sharps um, were, were uh, kind of in a position and in a role to not only take photos, but retain those photos. So yes. a lot of the photos that we use are uh, courtesy of the work of the Sharps, uh, including Annie Sharp. And so um, there's another connection uh, if you watch enough Tuesday talks, you'll eventually see that all of these things connect at some point. So in our tour of Belford Homes, we talked about the George Irvin house. And George Irvin uh, did not have a house constructed by Charles Belford, but he was a predecessor to Charles Belford in that he had a lumber yard that eventually became the, the Belford Lumber Company. He had a house uh, that's on university. It's still there. Um, it's a very beautiful home. The style is called Italianate. And after the, uh, the Irvin family lived there, they sold the house to Simon Enox, who was the postmaster in 1922. And so if you think about not only uh, sometimes these, these people who served this role were very prominent, but they might also have a very prominent home. And so uh, you have the postmaster living right across the street, uh, kind of the main thoroughfare through town east west, right across from the Methodist church. And, uh, and would have been kind of a very prominent member of the community, uh, especially at various points in time. So uh, there's always a connection somewhere and we'll point them out as much as we can, but uh, watch, watching this program will certainly uh, start to tie together a lot of threads uh, around Georgetown. But we had, uh, we were really uh, interested to find um, that we didn't just have postmaster men serving this role. In fact, as early as 1884, we had women serving the, the postmistress or, or postmaster really role. And they had some really interesting stories. Um, it was not always something that, that was uh, kind of uh, very well accepted. And so Anne, help me understand the controversy about the, the Roches. I'm assuming okay. I'm saying their name correctly. The Roches, yes. So it originally started with Frank T. Roche and we're again going back to an owner an editor of the Williamson County Sun, this time a little bit prior to John Sharp. Um, and his appointment originally in 1912 or 1914 was controversial. Um, so Postmaster General Burleson uh, wanted to appoint Frank T. Roach to Postmaster of Georgetown. Our representative um, Buchanan protested that and actually carried that directly to President Wilson with whom he filed charges presented by residents of Georgetown, but he was unsuccessful in blocking the appointment of Roach. Um, wow. So it becomes this whole battle within the Senate over the Georgetown postmaster and his appointment. Eventually Roach is confirmed, but just two years later, he 
passes away while his um, term is unfinished. And this is a, unusual. It happens that widows would often take over the appointment for the remainder of the, the term. But there was still a battle in Georgetown whether or not that would be acceptable for Mrs. Roche, Josephine, to take over as postmaster um, for her the remainder of her husband's term. And for a short while, we actually have um, sort of two postmasters. There's one that's appointed as acting postmaster in September of 1916 before Mrs. Roche Josephine is actually confirmed as acting postmaster in November 1916 to serve the remainder of her husband's term. What I think is really interesting about this is both acting postmasters were women. So it was Lavinia Henderson and Josephine Roche, uh, who were kind of battling it out in 1916 for control of the Georgetown Post Office. Um, and this kind of started us on this path of how many female postmasters have there been in Georgetown? I knew personally that it wasn't unusual in this area, at least, for um, women to be appointed postmasters. In fact, Hattie Cluck was the very first postmaster of Cedar Park. You also have some in the late 1800s in Round Rock and several in Taylor, kind of all throughout the county, but I didn't really know Georgetown specifically. And so starting to investigate this, we actually found out again that the first one was appointed in 1884 and that was Miss Adeline Talbot. We've got her stuff. So right before so we showed a map from 1885. So yes. the year before we have that map, we had the first uh, woman postmaster, um, Ada yes. Talbot. And she came, from, she came from a family that is, um, sometimes we talk about people who are like, these, these are the Texas myth. These people were living out the Texas myth. Um, I would say that about that family. her family. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So I'm sorry, I misspoke 1882. Actually, she has to be reconfirmed in 1884 because she gets married. Oh, wow. Um, oh, okay. So um, yes, her family definitely is this Texas myth. They came from Massachusetts. Um, there's members of the family that are governors and in, in very high offices over back in Massachusetts. Some of the girls actually go back to boarding school. Um, there's Talbot papers at a variety of universities across the United States, actually. Um, what's interesting about Ada is her, her father, Elias W. Talbot, had actually been postmaster in 1857. And he is removed at the beginning of the Civil War because he was a unionist. He was a very staunch unionist. He was very vocally supportive of the union. Um, he was very close friends with Sam Houston. Actually, whenever Sam Houston would come into Georgetown, he would stay with the Talbot family. Okay. Um, and for people that might not realize that, Sam Houston was a unionist as well. Right. Um, and actually large chunks of Williamson County were unionists. Williamson County was actually one of the few counties in Texas that voted to remain in the union when they uh, put the secession question up to vote. And so... At the beginning of the Civil War, uh, Talbot was removed. He is actually the only postmaster that I have been able to find a record of that was forcibly removed um, as part of the beginning of the Confederacy. And so it's interesting then that during the Reconstruction era, a Talbot is back into the postmaster office. Uh, right. It shows that influence the family still had within town. And if we go to, I think the next slide, we can see there's our Georgetown appointments um, recorded in the book. And there's Ada's name, Alba Talbot, 1882, March 1882. And then you see it actually changes to, uh, to Will Whittle in 84 because she has uh, been married during this time period. So she was the postmaster as a single lady and then got mm -hmm. married. And they basically had to do an update with her married name uh, mm -hmm. being Whittle. So if Whittle sounds familiar because you've been watching our program, think Whittle and Harold, 
think predecessors to the Belford Lumber Company. There's almost always a tie to the Belford Lumber Company There's in our Tuesday talks. The... And, and so that's the one that we have today. Um, but wow, she uh, that's quite a, a, a cool role. And I wish that our maps went back a little bit further because then we would have been clear on where the post office was, where she was serving as postmaster. But 1884, mm -hmm. you know, 1882 to 1884, it was very likely that same place on the north side of the square. So if you want to think about uh, Miss Talbot becoming uh, Mrs. Whittle, if you want to think about where she was working, it would have been uh, the north side of the square in buildings that are no longer with us, uh, but the history remains. Yes. And so, um... Between 1849 and 2021, I could identify at least eight um, female postmasters who have served in Georgetown. We are missing um, some in like the 70s where we don't have the records or they're not publicly available yet. Um, and hopefully the US Postal Service has been updating that nice little graphic you showed earlier on their website Eventually, we'll get those back into the 70s and have a more complete list. But yes, so, so if you have insider information and know who the postmasters were in Georgetown in the 70s uh, through about 1981, uh, let yeah. us know. You can email us, us and and share that info. We're uh, we're glad to be able to complete that list. And it's something that um, I just wanted to point out. It's very, uh, very common actually for women to be postmasters. In fact, it starts during the colonial era. It increases during the Civil War. It increases during both world wars. And by 1958, you actually get this quote from the postmaster general, Arthur Summerfield. And it's this, this is a direct quote from him. With our near 16,000 women postmasters representing close to half our entire management staff, we believe it is fair to say that the American Post Office Department recognizes the management abilities of women perhaps more than any other private or governmental organization anywhere. 16,000. 16,000 women. And so that is, again, representing almost half of all postmasters in the United States at that time. Wow. And that's in 1958. Um, so in like 1949, 40% of postmasters were women. That makes, that makes a lot of sense to me, um, you know, kind of from an availability standpoint. Um, mm -hmm. And also, you know, thinking back through Texas history and sometimes you just needed someone who was available for the job. Um, there was a lot of agricultural and ranching work that was going on. We joke a lot about this still being the wild west but there's yes. there's a sense of that, that that is really true and there was a lot of farm and agricultural labor that needed to be done and so to me it makes a lot of sense that you would have the best person available um, to serve that role and a role that maybe didn't require um, as much physical labor as some other roles or um, kind of the, you know, you may not have seen women in other professional roles the same way, but this one seems like it would have been really well um, kind of situated for, for women even very early on. Um, but something that I found really interesting and you were describing to me that this was a role that uh, was also much earlier than I would have anticipated, mm -hmm. this is a role that was available to African-American women and not just yes. white women. Yes, so in particular, after the Civil War, um, you begin to see African-American women appointed to serve as postmasters, um, beginning with Anna DeMoss in Louisiana in 1872. And then um, one of the best known examples is Minnie Cox, who served as postmaster of Indianola, uh, Indianola Mississippi, beginning in 1891 and she served until 1902. Um, she actually got, was threatened and forced to tender her resignation um, in 1902. And President Roosevelt just refused to accept it because he knew that she was trying to resign under pressure um, from the white community in Indianola. And so he actually refused to accept it. And his quote is that he wanted to test the powers of the federal government 
to interfere in the race problem. And he chose to suspend service at the Indianola post office rather than accept her resignation. Um, and shortly thereafter, she was actually threatened in such a manner that she and her family left the town. Um, and uh, it sort of, they, <laughs> Her, the remainder of her term, they didn't really have a fully functional post office in Indianola until 1904. Um, it's important to note today, though, that the post office is named after her <laughs> there. Um, and she did go on to have much other success. She formed one of the first Black-owned banks in Mississippi and one of the first Black-owned life insurance companies in the United States. Um, wow. So she did have a successful career, but... It is just interesting that uh, there were, an, it was a, an area that was open to women and in particular open to women of color um, at a time when you don't see that opportunity, especially in many governmental jobs or managerial governmental jobs. Right. That's really, that's, that's good information. Um, it's so fun to me when we uh, uncover histories, uh, stories that we may not be as familiar with or uh, that share a new perspective on history. Uh, I'm not sure that I would have wanted to be a postmaster, um, but this seems like a, an interesting job and, and a, a fairly prominent role in the community. Uh, I may not have uh, enough connections with, uh, with senators or representatives to do that, so I don't know that I would have made the cut, but um, how fascinating, uh, all of these different stories about different postmasters. Um, we do finally come to uh, the building that we're celebrating today, um, kind of circling back to this. Um, I, you know, I, for, I forget sometimes, you know, when you look at news, news has really changed over time. Um, some things have, but some things have remained the same. And so um, this is interesting to me because this is not from the Williamson uh, County Sun newspaper. This is from the megaphone at Southwestern from University. From so this is the university paper kind of acknowledging the opening of the new post office. Uh, it was built during the depression. Mm -hmm. And so that was interesting to me too, because through various uh, bits of research that I've done, it's clear that real estate values had dropped during the, the recession, uh, the, the great recession in, in Georgetown. And the, it looks like um, there's pretty clear evidence that a lot of people had a hard time paying their loans. Um, during that period. But here we are constructing this brand new building, which the megaphone is describing as the last word in beauty and utility. And so, Anne, how did we get a post office building in the middle of the depression? So that, yeah, that kind of sums it up, beauty and utility. That was part of a lot of the New Deal programs was WPA Works and Civilian Conservation Corps, um, putting the people to work how they could. Uh, so we do have CCC camps in this area in Central Texas that we have a lot of records of young men in particular from this area where they couldn't get work on farms or in town going to the CCC camps um, just to do things. Uh, dams, several dams and the LCRA system were built during that time as well. Um, so you get a lot of that type of infrastructure development that's happening. And it's important to note too that yes, we're at kind of the height of the Great Depression and buildings are being built. They're also city buildings. So they're, they're uh, utilized sometimes in ways to help the city um, that we may not expect. So I don't have any reports of people ever sleeping in the post office building, but we do have reports that people during the depression slept in the courthouse as a place for shelter. So having these kind of buildings downtown would have been a great help to the community in a lot of different ways that we might not expect. But then there's the creepy part. There's the creepy part. Um, so it's quoted <laughs> in this article that, yes, it's the building is modern in every respect and represents the latest in beauty of architecture and design. The building is three stories, two above ground, and a large basement. White brick was used in its construction in order to harmonize with the predominant building color in the city. Every known facility for handling the mail efficiently is included in the building. An interesting feature to the visitors 
was the secret passageway and office for postal inspectors, allowing them to enter the building and observe all patrons in the buildings without their presence being known. This passage is a continuous system of runways, making it possible for the watcher to follow the movements of a person from the moment he enters the building and at the watcher's election, confront the person without his presence having been previously known. So you could have a, a post office employee just suddenly appear next to you and suddenly you would not appear. have known how they got there because they had this internal network that they could keep an eye on. All What were people doing at the post office that they had to be watched so carefully? I do not know, <laughs> nor do I know that I, I think I want to know. <laughs> That's wild. Um, so, uh, but you know, uh, apparently this is of great interest to Southwestern students. We're really glad that they captured that. Uh, something that I would not, and I've been in the building and I couldn't tell you uh, necessarily where that was or where that had happened. So um, that's quite something. Um, oh, we just got a it's comment. A uh, comment. So thanks, yeah. thanks to a everybody lot of for cash. coming. The post office handled a lot of cash. So that would have been a reason to need to keep an eye on people. And that's Again, a good point too. Particularly during the depression era, that is something to consider. Uh, so thanks so much for that tip. We really appreciate when y'all share information that yes, we don't have. We do. That's really helpful. Uh, so, you know, if you think through uh, how we do so much online banking and uh, digital transfer of money today, but you did not have that available. Everything had to be in cash or some kind of bank note or you know checks were even a little bit different um back then and so uh yeah great great insight why why they needed uh some looking out and so um that's so funny uh what's really wonderful to me uh and this kind of uh brings starts bringing us into today um so this post office served in its location for um a, a bit over 50 years and what was uh kind of ties into, we're talking about Preservation Month. The, uh, Georgetown has four National Register Historic Districts. And when you're on the National Register, it doesn't really include any protections. Most protections are at the local level, uh, and kind of deployed by, by the city. But at the national level, the, the recognition of uh, important historic places is, is done through the Secretary of the Interior. And this building, as it turned 50 years old, they submitted an application to the Secretary of the Interior to say, hey, this building is reaching its 50th birthday. And on its 50th birthday, we want you to confirm, we would like to have this building listed on the National Register of Historic Places. We think it's that important and that beautiful and that architecturally intact. And so Secretary of the Interior, can you confirm for us that this building would qualify even as it's barely reaching the age that they began looking at this. So buildings usually have to be at least 50 years old in order to qualify for the National Register. And so by 1986, they had received that confirmation and the Williamson County Courthouse National Register District, which is kind of the, the courthouse square uh, in the middle of downtown, that had already been established in the 70s, but it was expanded in the 1980s specifically to include this building in that National Register Historic District. And so that is kind of um, a special thing. You can see the front here in 1986, not very different from what you saw in 1934. We still have that big broad sidewalk. We've got the front steps. We've got these great lamps out front. You've got the windows with all the window panes and then you've got United States Post Office up at the top. They had some notes, particularly about this building in the National Register nomination form, but I want to read the one on the bottom because I think it's kind of a, a beautiful way to talk about this building. It says the post office is the most significant building within the proposed extension, kind of adding in that uh, East 8th Street block to the National Register Historic District that had already been established. The structure is the city's most outstanding example of Georgian revival architecture, a style rarely found in the town. And by rarely, this might be the only one. Since its construction in 1931, the facility has served as an important social magnet to the downtown, and it remains as the city's only post office. And so um, this has been 
uh, kind of included in that National Register District. It's got a record uh, with the Secretary of the Interior and thankfully also some photographs from that time period. So we can see again, what it was like before the oak trees got in the way. <laughs> and then we can see a couple of other um, photos from the Main Street archives. Um, it's really beautiful uh, in the way that the, the windows and the window openings and these uh, kind of fake columns on the front called pilasters, it creates some really beautiful shadows and depth on the building facade. Um, and it, it's really nicely done. Uh, and then we see the building interior when it was still functioning as a post office. So some of y'all watching uh, might remember visiting the post office here. Uh, and you can see the shiny floor and some of this beautiful stonework for the counters um, is, is really great to see. Two years later, though, the post office moved. And so this is our, our last uh, our, our last switch of location. The post office uh, built a new facility at Leander Road in Interstate 35. Um, it's a larger facility. And if you look at the number of uh, post uh, postal service trucks and vehicles that are able to use the facility off of Leander Road compared to what they were able to accommodate in the downtown, it makes it pretty clear. You know, with Georgetown expanding, they were relying much more on vehicles to help carry the mail, and they needed a facility that would be able to accommodate and accomplish that. And so that meant that the old post office building was vacant. Well, it became Georgetown City Hall. And so uh, it was City Hall for quite some time, and it is taking on new life now. So as we wrap up our presentation, we want to share that a new business has come to this building. Uh, the city of Georgetown uh, sold this building and we have new city hall on Martin Luther King Jr. Street, which used to be the library. Uh, that's a whole story for a different time. That's a different day. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but this, uh, so this has gone into private ownership and it is reopening as the city post chop house. So this is a steakhouse restaurant. There's also an event space on the second floor. And what they've shared with us is that this Thursday on May 13th from 4 to 5 p.m., they will uh, be available uh, for you to stop by and visit. They will have a book of their photographs from the renovation that they undertook. So what's important to know and kind of fun to know is that this uh, is a building that has some uh, Texas Historical Commission protections on it. And so the changes had to be coordinated with the state of Texas. So the foyer when you walk in uh, is very much what it was. The post boxes are still there. Uh, the, the little mailboxes with the, the glass fronts. And so a lot of those features are still there. The name City Post is definitely reflecting the building's history. And so uh, sometimes when a building takes on a new use, uh, there are a lot of changes made to the interior. There have been some changes made for that restaurant, but there is a lot, especially right when you walk in the door, that's remained the same. So if you're interested in visiting them on Thursday from 4 to 5 p.m., uh, go to City Post. It's at 113 East 8th Street, right across the street from 600 Degrees Pizza. And they said that they would uh, be able to make their photo album of those uh, remodel changes available if you want to stop by and visit. So that might be a fun thing to do on Thursday afternoon. Help them celebrate their 90th birthday and the new life that this building is taking on as it passes the 90 year mark. So we're really excited to see it cruise on to 100. Well, as we wrap up our contact information, if you need it, uh, if you wanna share stories with us, if you've got follow-up questions, if you wanna talk to us about the design guidelines or have other questions that we can assist with, you can email us at historic at georgetown.org or you can also call us, I'm at 512. 9303581 and Anne is at 512-930-6614. So next week we're going to be talking about the Milam building on the west side of the square. We're also going to be talking about cast iron storefronts and why we have so many of them in our downtown. So that'll be a program that captures a building history of a building with a name on it and also an architectural feature that our downtown is really well known for. We're pretty excited about that. Um, so if you have any just questions, for the storefronts. yes. Uh, so if you have any questions, kind of a last call for those. Thanks to everybody that joined us live on Zoom and also on the city's Facebook Live. We'll be back on both next week. And and as always, I really appreciate your knowledge, your storytelling, and giving me some fun details like people carrying letters in their hats, uh, and also 
spy passages in the post spy office passages. building. <laughs> Which may have uh, had more of a function than we could imagine. <laughs> I mean, buildings are just much more exciting than we sometimes realize. So uh, as um, much as we're able to gain that information and share that with y'all, we certainly do. Um, so we really hope that you'll join us again next week. Remember for May for Preservation Month, we are going to be uh, sharing uh, stories every week. But if you're not getting enough from us, uh, City Council is going to do a Preservation Month proclamation tonight. So that'll be in City Council chambers. Uh, we'll be doing an official uh, ceremony to uh, mark that moment. We're really excited about that. We'll do an official recognition of our buildings that are turning milestone birthdays uh, in that proclamation. So very fun. And then um, if you want some in-person activity, then please know that the Williamson Museum is going to do an event on Saturday. So Andy, you want to share details on that real quick as we close? They will be doing their marking history tour on Saturday. It's 10 to noon. Um, it is kind of come and go self-guided. You can stop in the museum and grab a map to find all the characters that will be around the square, or you can just wander around the square and go up to the people that are in costume. I can't guarantee that everyone in costume on the square will be affiliated with the museum, but um, <laughs> I assume most of them will be. Um, if you've been in the past, I know that they have changed out some of the stories and some of the characters, so it's not the same that uh, you might've previously experienced, but again, self-guided, just stop by the museum, grab a map, and then make your way around the square and talk to some, some people from the past in Georgetown. Oh, and that's also, so exciting. Uh, there's a note from, from uh, Michael Walton, who just, he watched from the event space that we just mentioned. So he's watching from City Post, and he says, there will be no spy passages at City Post, just FYI. Um, which there's some debate amongst other participants on, or will there, or you're just not telling us that. I don't know. <laughs> so uh, so uh, update us uh, on any spy passages, but I think those got removed in the remodel. Uh, but please do go check out their photos and go say hi to one of our new neighbors in the downtown. And we will catch you next Tuesday at noon for the latest edition of Tuesday Talks with Britton and Ann. And we'll uncover some more fun histories of Georgetown. So. Thank you all for joining us and we hope Thank you have you. a great week.